last lesson, you learned that nutrients are absorbed primarily in the small intestine, where microscopic villi allow the nutrients to enter the bloodstream by diffusion. This process of absorption is the first step in the life activity of transport. Absorption also occurs in the lungs, so the oxygen you inhale can enter the bloodstream. Once a substance is absorbed by the body, it must be circulated around the body so that all the cells have access to it. Circulation is accomplished by the circulatory system, which is made up of the heart, blood vessels, and blood. The heart is a muscular organ that is made up of four chambers, two atria, and two ventricles. The atria are at the top of the heart and receive incoming blood. The ventricles are on the bottom and are responsible for pumping blood all over the body. The right and left sides of the heart are named based on the fact that we are facing the person whose heart we are examining. The right atrium and ventricle are found on the right side of the person's body. But when we look at these chambers, they are on our left. The person's left atrium and ventricle are found on our right. It's a little confusing, but still logical. The heart exerts pressure on the walls of the blood vessels when the heart is pumping. This is known as systolic blood pressure. When the heart is relaxed, the pressure is much lower and it is called diastolic blood pressure. There are three types of blood vessels, arteries, capillaries, and veins. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. Arteries branch off repeatedly, becoming smaller. Then they are called arterioles. Arterioles continue to branch until they are so small they are microscopic. These tiny microscopic vessels are called capillaries. Capillaries deliver blood to every single cell in your body, dropping off nutrients and picking up waste. Then it's time for the blood to head back to the heart. Capillaries rejoin to form small veins called venules. The venules merge to become veins, and the veins deliver blood back to the heart. There are two circuits involved in circulation, the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. The pulmonary circuit brings blood from the heart to the lungs and back to the heart again. The pulmonary circuit begins when blood flows through the inferior and superior vena cava to the right atrium of the heart. From the right atrium, the blood flows into the right ventricle. The right ventricle pumps the blood through the pulmonary arteries away from the heart to the lungs. Within the lungs, arteries branch to become arterioles and then capillaries. In the capillaries, oxygen is able to diffuse into the blood from the air while carbon dioxide diffuses out. The oxygen-rich blood then travels through venules and finally the pulmonary vein back to the heart where it enters the left atrium. This is where the pulmonary circuit ends and the systemic circuit begins. The systemic circuit travels from heart to body and back to heart again. The heart has just received blood from the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. From the left atrium, blood flows into the left ventricle. The left ventricle contracts, forcing the blood through the aorta. The aorta is a major artery that branches, sending some of the oxygenated blood upwards towards the head and some downwards towards the rest of the body. Throughout the body, the arteries branch to become arterioles and then capillaries. The capillaries deliver blood to every single cell in the body. Here, the blood drops off the oxygen brought in by the lungs and picks up carbon dioxide and other wastes. 
The capillaries carry this deoxygenated blood as they merge into venules and then into veins on their way back to the heart. The blood then enters the right atrium of the heart through the inferior and superior vena cava to complete the systemic circuit. It's quite a journey through the pulmonary and systemic circuits, yet a blood cell can make the entire trip in just about one minute. That's pretty impressive. The human circulatory system is a closed circulatory system. That is, one in which the blood remains enclosed within the vessels. The body uses this system to transport oxygen, nutrients, hormones, and waste products to their correct destinations. Humans are not the only organism that complete the activity of transport, however. Many other animals also have a closed circulatory system. Still other animals have an open circulatory system, where the blood bathes the tissues and organs directly rather than remaining inside vessels. Examples of organisms with open circulatory systems are insects and mollusks. Plants are also living and must therefore complete the task of transport. Instead of blood vessels, plants have vascular tissue called xylem and phloem to transport water and nutrients. Plants do not have a heart to pump materials around. Instead, they use a force called transpiration that uses the sun's ability to evaporate water to draw materials upward. Even unicellular organisms need to perform the act of transport. They use diffusion and osmosis to move material into and out of the cell. Materials circulate throughout the cell by a process known as cyclosis, where the cytoplasm flows around the cell. Transport is evidently a very important process that all organisms must complete, or survival would not be possible. <laughs>